I'm in the Old Cemetery in Ackworth, New Hampshire today. It's a great example of a late 18th, early 19th century cemetery loaded with slate gravestones. And that's what I'm really here for. At this cemetery, the first thing you'll notice are those slate gravestones. They are neat and uniform. So it's surprising to see a large marble obelisk off in the back corner. It doesn't seem that it belongs among the rest. So I go to investigate. Okay, here at the back corner of the cemetery is a very tall obelisk for the Greer family. Here over on the side is Jane. And Jane says here, Jane, the daughter of Thomas and Hannah Greer, died February 17th, 1812, at age 18. And then the inscription goes on to say, it's a little faded here, but uh, she was the first victim of the spotted fever in this town. Historic epidemic in a small town? Huh. This sounds like a good one. I'll grant you, cemetery wandering might not be for everyone, what with all the death and dead people everywhere. But death was a prominent and pervasive part of life historically, and cemeteries help bring that notion into sharp focus. Sure, death isn't the happiest thing to think about, but it's in learning about death that we are able to understand so much more about life. For each episode, I'll go to a different historic cemetery and pick out a random and intriguing gravestone. I'll research the life and times of the person in that grave and report my findings back to you. There's a story under every stone. I'm Gail Golick, and this is The Secret Life of Death. Before we get too far along, let's first set the scene. Ackworth is a small, rural town situated in the southwest corner of New Hampshire. Typical of central New England, the landscape is known for being beautifully hilly and rocky. The town's modern history begins in the 1760s, at the end of the French and Indian War, after which the natives that had called these uplands home moved farther north, and Europeans moved in. Most of the people who moved to Ackworth in its formative years made their living as farmers, or tried to. These people were true homesteaders. The virgin forests had to be felled, fields cleared, homes built, roads laid out, and community connections forged. Young Jane Greer's family settled in Ackworth at the turn of the 19th century, following the flood of new settlers from overpopulated areas in New England. And like all of those immigrants, the Greers were looking for a piece of land, a farm, and a chance at a good life. Chance, of course, can go either way, and history is full of stories about those who were, by chance, caught in the crossfire of events beyond their control or comprehension. And such was Ackworth, 1812. When Jane Greer died in mid-February, the townspeople of Ackworth had no idea what was about to happen. Over the next three months, 53 others would die during the spotted fever epidemic. Now, at the time, the town's population stood at around 1,500, so the deaths of 53 people amounted to a small percentage of the population. But that was 53 people dead in only three months, and not to mention the number who were sick but survived. It must have seemed apocalyptic. The spotted fever the gravestones refer to was probably typhus, an infectious disease caused by a microorganism from the genus Rickettsia. It's carried by lice and fleas, who excrete the infectious microorganism in their feces. When a person scratches the bites, they inadvertently rub the microorganism-laden feces into the bites, transmitting the infection into their bloodstream. The spotted fever that popped up in Ackworth seemed abnormally contagious and virulent, suggesting a new strain not seen in the area before. It spread rapidly, with cases popping up in opposite parts of the town at the same time, overwhelming families and caretakers alike. Sally Nesmith 
a midwife in town who attended many of the sick families during the epidemic, expressed to her sister in a letter the fear and desperation the townspeople felt. Sally writes, April 1st, 1812. We are all well at present, but how long we may be so favored, God only knows, for many sicken and die in a few hours. Mr. McCollum's family were all well last Saturday, yet this afternoon he and three of his children were buried. Their corpses, with one other, Sally McMurphy, were brought to the meeting house, and a discourse was delivered by a Mr. Wells of Alstead from the words, Lord, save us, we perish, to a large concourse of people from this and neighboring towns. The like was never before seen in this town, five lying dead at one time. There has been a great many deaths here. In our age of advanced medical treatments, it's almost impossible to imagine one family suffering like the McCollums did, losing four family members in a short time. Back in the cemetery, I look for the McCollum family's gravestones, and I find them not far from Jane Greer. Here are the McCollums. Here is Mr. Alexander McCollum, died March 30th, 1812, at 37 years. Next to Alexander McCollum are not just three, but four of his children. The McCollums were another family that homesteaded in Ackworth. Alexander and wife Jane, along with members of both of their extended families, came here from Londonderry, New Hampshire, around 1801, establishing homes, farms, and families, looking to improve their fortunes. Okay, and here, right next to him, are the McCollum children. James, Fanny, Eliza, and Lucinda. Uh, James, Eliza, and Lucinda all died on March 31st, all on the same day. And that's one day after their father. And then Fanny, she died a couple weeks later on April 12th, 1812. God, can you imagine? The scale of losses of the McCollum family were likely unprecedented to the doctors and caretakers at the time. Epidemics where entire households would fall ill were common enough, but rarely did an illness wipe out most of a family. The rate of infection and mortality with the strain of the disease was something new, and doctors of the region certainly took note. Dr. Joseph Gallup of Vermont published a book in 1815 reporting the observations he made while treating the spotted fever epidemics that passed through New England during the early 1810s. From his writing, it's clear that he was befuddled by this outbreak, and that it was unlike anything he had seen before. Dr. Gallup. It was considered a very extraordinary disease, not subject to the usual control of remedies, but medicine of Herculean strength must be administered. All was mystery. It assailed all characters and ages. The aged were the most exempt, the middle-aged more liable to it, and children most of all. The duration of the disease accorded with its irregular character. From Dr. Gallup's notes, it's plain that the usual treatments used to deal with febrile illnesses were not working. Doctors and midwives were forced to rely heavily on their pharmacopoeia of herbs and liquors to concoct various stimulating drinks in an effort to help comfort their patients and relieve their symptoms. But regardless of the treatment, the doctors were never going to cure anyone. Because first and foremost, they had no concept of what was actually going on in their patients. An infection. At the turn of the 19th century, it was accepted across the entirety of the medical community that illnesses were the byproduct of an imbalance of bodily fluid. Treatments such as bleeding, purging, sweating, and giving stimulating drinks were designed to help restore that balance by either removing excess fluid or helping to redistribute it throughout the body. But even if the doctors were woefully informed of the true nature of the disease, they were at least well-trained in observation. There was general widespread agreement that the spotted fever progressed in three notable stages. First, a sudden and severe headache, chills, nausea, and vomiting. Second, a tremendous fever 
delirium, and extreme fearfulness. Third, coma, eruption of spots on the skin, weakening pulse, muscle spasms. And then, in some cases, death. Onset of symptoms was sudden. It seemed that patients who exhibited a mild form of the infection could linger for weeks, sometimes recovering, sometimes not. But the more intense the initial symptoms, the more likely it would be that death would occur, and quickly, as in the case with the town's first victim, Jane Greer. An Ackworth Town History from 1869 relays the story of what happened in Jane Greer's case. Jane worked by herself all day on a large meal for a dinner party when, after placing the food upon the table, she was taken with a violent headache. Dr. Carlton was called and immediately pronounced the case spotted fever. Medicine made no impression, and before midnight, she was a corpse. At 19 years old, Jane was just the demographic most susceptible to this infectious disease. She might not have ever been exposed to typhus in any form, and though young and healthy, she had no immunity at all, and so the infection raged unchecked. It's no wonder that medicine made no impression. The go-to remedies of the time, such as tonics made with spirits of peppermint, compound spirit of lavender, and camphorated tincture of opium, were not going to save her. So, how did Jane get typhus, and how did it spread so quickly? The first clues come from the gravestones. They show us that most of the deaths during the 1812 outbreak occurred between February and April, winter into spring. The winter of 1811 to 1812 falls within a strange weather pattern called the Little Ice Age, a period where temperatures were well below normal, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. Weather observations from the time noted that New England had gone through some particularly unusual winters during that time period. Dr. Job Wilson, another physician studying the epidemics in New England, showed that the winters and springs from 1811 through 1814 were not only cold and stormy, but there were also wild temperature fluctuations, week to week and day to day, making for a truly unpleasant mix of conditions. So, the weather, on top of being cold, was also unpredictable, which kept people hunkered down in their homes. People had to stay bundled up, even in their houses, which meant they were less likely to wash themselves, their clothing, or their bedding. That behavior produced the perfect environment for louse and flea populations to thrive. But the human population was also thriving in this part of New England. Recall, Ackworth had a population of around 1,500 residents during the 1812 epidemic. Compare that to today's population of only 900, which is spread across almost twice as many households. Needless to say, conditions in the average home were cramped. The tight quarters and relatively unhygienic conditions provided the perfect scenario for incubation and transmission of spotted fever throughout the town. But it would be unwittingly introduced from somewhere else. For the last clue, we head back to the town history. Back then, just as today, people tended to go a little batty when they were cooped up in cramped conditions for too long. When and if the weather ever broke, those stir-crazy people took the opportunity to venture out and see friends and family. People like Hannah and Thomas Greer, Jane's parents. You see, not long before Jane's death, her parents made a trip to Massachusetts, a place where typhus epidemics had been making the rounds for years. And the reason Jane had been making dinner and setting the table all by herself the night of her death was because her parents recently home from their trip, were sick in bed. They recovered. Jane did not. That's how it began, and the infection spread with vicious speed. As more people came down with some degree of symptom, good and dutiful neighbors were not about to let their friends and family go without help. Again, midwife Sally Nesmith. I watched at Mr. Perrin's last Saturday night. They are all sick. But Mr. P and the youngest child are getting better. Last night I watched young Samuel Anderson, who has been very sick, but he too is recovering. For three weeks I have done nothing but help to care for the sick 
and attend funerals. I sleep always when I can get the time, for there are so many sick that people are bad off for watchers. I am busy most of the time. If this fever should continue as bad as it has been, I am afraid there will not be enough well people to take care of the sick. Physicians and midwives were welcomed with open arms by the families of the desperately ill, but there was little that could be done for the sick. Their treatments often did more harm than good, not only because they further weakened already delicate patients, but because of the practice of the attentive neighbor. Popping from funeral to sickbed and back again may have helped spread the sickness throughout town. It only took one infected person passing on infected fleas and lice to set off a chain of deaths in that one small town. Just as the Greers must have brought back infected fleas and lice to Ackworth from their visit to Massachusetts, Sally Nesmith and other caregivers may have carried the infection from home to home. But it was a scenario that repeated itself not just in Ackworth, but in every small New England town several times over. As a town, Ackworth was never quite the same. The events of 1812 were just the first in a series of natural and man-made disasters that affected the region. New England had become economically volatile and environmentally vulnerable, and the constant string of difficulties soured people on the idea of toughing it out there one more season. Children of the homesteaders began to leave in droves, and the population declined steadily from its high in the 1810s, as young people sought their fortunes out west. The Greers were no exception to this trend. Parents Thomas and Hannah Greer and children John, James, Lima, and Levi survived the epidemic. Thomas and Hannah stayed in Ackworth, dying years later, and buried next to daughter Jane. The three Greer boys moved out west, but sister Lima stayed in town, where she lived out the rest of her life. Miss Lima Greer was unmarried, so traces of her adult life are scarce. But in her later years, she left a mark by replacing the smaller slate gravestones on the family plot with the large marble obelisk we see there today. Presumably, Lima picked out the epitaph for Sister Jane, the one commemorating the 50-plus people who died during the spotted fever epidemic. By the time the Greer family monument was erected, Lima was an old woman, and there were probably few others in town who remembered the epidemic of 1812. The inscription on the Greer family monument would ensure no one would ever forget. With no heirs left in Ackworth, the Greer family's connection to the town ends with Lima's death in 1863. As for the sole surviving member of the McCollum family, mother and wife, Mrs. Jane McCollum, life did not get easier. At the time, women rarely owned things outright, so when Alexander died, Jane McCollum did not automatically inherit their farm. However, according to probate records, as a widow, Jane McCollum was entitled to one-third of her husband's estate. But that was only after his debts had been satisfied. The land, buildings, livestock, and every rug, bucket, and spoon were sold. And 19th century widows had few options. Remarry, or hope to be taken in by a relative. In that regard, Jane was not without help entirely. Historic town records indicate that the next person to buy the McCollum farm was a man by the name of William Anderson. Jane had a brother by that name who lived in the area. Perhaps he bought the farm, moved in and let Jane stay, or maybe Jane was taken in by one of her cousins who also lived in Ackworth. But even if she had a roof over her head, Jane McCollum's troubles were not over. Two months after the deaths of her husband and four children, she gave birth to a full-term baby. It was a boy whom she named Alexander after his late father. Any joy she would have felt at the birth of this child was short-lived. Baby Alexander passed away just shy of his first birthday, born sickly, perhaps, from his exposure to typhus in utero. He is buried in Ackworth, next to the father and the siblings he never knew. What happened to Jane McCollum after that?
Her name disappears into the ether after the death of baby Alexander in 1813. Maybe she remarried and changed her name and stayed in New Hampshire. Or maybe she went out west where another of her brothers had settled. But either way, it's unclear what became of her. Today, Ackworth is a quiet New England town. There's a general store slash post office, a couple of churches and a school, and it hums along with citizens who love their town and are proud to live there. But the past still whispers. It's everywhere, hovering just at the edge of modern life. Hey, thanks for listening. And a very special thanks to the voice actors in this episode, Sarah Manning and Mark Pipcorn. This has been Episode 1, Epidemic. And for more episodes, check out the website, thesecretlifeofdeath.com. And for weekly updates and fun cemetery photos, find us on Facebook. I'm Gail Golick, and this is The Secret Life of Death.